Now today, uh, timing is everything. And uh, we happen to uh, time our speaker today, probably riding the biggest wave of her life. Uh, you saw her, she was on the uh, front page of the LA Times earlier this week and has been involved in a uh, large dispute with the food bay. But to introduce uh, her today is our own chairman of the board, heavyweight debater in his own right, Eddie Tabash, everyone. Uh, good morning, everybody. Part of what we do, in addition to showing by evidence and logic and reason that religion is false, is also showing that pseudoscience is false. And this is the first time that we've ever had a speaker within three days of their getting a front page article about themselves in the Los Angeles Times. And I think it's absolutely incredible that we have somebody this talented, this brilliant, and this funny taking on the purveyors of nonsense. Uh, Yvette Dentremont had a very busy and exciting week, as you saw in Thursday's LA Times. She is in an online war with Food Babe, and she's in that war to protect all of us from misinformation. And she'll talk about some of the general ways to separate the BS from good science and give us the information that we need to do that. She holds bachelor's degrees in diverse fields, theater and chemistry, along with a master's degree in forensic science. With a background working as an analytic chemist, she currently runs her Science Babe website full time, which is now called SciBabe. And this is a wonderful mix of debunking pseudoscience in combination with humor and real science. So let us welcome a true celebrity of science, reason, and humor, uh, today's guest speaker, and today's now famous guest speaker, Yvette Dentremont. I, I'm way not gonna live up to that. <laughs> I'll do my best. So, um, as you said, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about BS detection, or my 10 rules of BS detection, and uh, the, this might be a little premature to call it the fall of Food Babe. We're gonna call it the stumble of Food Babe, because she's, she still has 938,000 followers on Facebook, so we're, we're trying to, to chip away at this, but it looks like we've made our first strides towards her maybe uh, having her reputation tarnished a bit in the popular media. So let's, uh, here's on with the show. Um, but I, I also like to do something like this, <laughs> a little bit of uh, me being goofy, because who doesn't like a babe who can pick at the babe title a little bit? Uh, because I certainly don't take it that seriously. But when I started my website, so first part one, uh, rules of BS detection. When I started my website, if ever I got something like this, and I like to work a lot with memes, I would look at every single point and try to see if there was any veracity to it. Um, something like this, salmonella. What does it do with salmonella? Does it make it stronger? Does it get rid of it? Um, it it's, let's see, does a, for promotion of lymph flow, how does it do it? Bladder infections, what's the dosage for it? Uh, regenerate connective tissue. Are we putting it on amputees? Like, what is, how could this possibly do all of these things? And after looking through and debunking every single one of these, all I could find for something like this was that it makes stuff smell like lemons and, and maybe possibly grass. So there really wasn't a lot of, of veracity to this. And I thought there has to be a way for people to look at something like this and instead of looking up if any of it was true, just think, look at this, take, make a snap judgment on it and go, this is BS, not spend any more time or money on it. But the problem with this <laughs> is that, of course, we think 
every, right? Everything on the internet is true at first. And I know this is very silly to think about, but here's the thing, we have to parse through all the information on the internet and make a judgment on whether or not it's true. And there's so much information out there. And we have to think, how can we tell if something is reputable or not? How can we tell if that article that says, a study in 2011 says, well, where's the study? What's the reputability behind it? And I want people to start thinking when they look at something and start thinking very skeptically if what they see is true. And it's hard to tell if you're not trained where the line of demarcation is between science and pseudoscience. So the point of this is to give people some guidelines to be able to see if what they're looking at is science or pseudoscience. Now, <laughs> there is another reason why this slide in particular isn't true, because obviously Abraham Lincoln said this. Obviously. <laughs> it's, uh, right? <laughs> so our first rule, just to hop right into the rules of BS detection, if they tell you they are making a fortune on you so you can't trust them. So, I mean, how often have you heard this one, well, you can't trust them. And this is Big Pharma, Monsanto, the rep where are my reptilians at? I got any reptilians in the audience? Uh, ooh, we got, right, right there, I've got a reptilian in the audience. Like, meetings later, right, sir? Absolutely. <laughs> so. This one you hear very often from people who are trying to say, you can't trust them, they're making a profit on you. Now I want you to think, is profit necessarily a reason not to trust someone? Now I say no to this, because it's not always a reason not to trust someone. People are allowed to make a profit. You have to think, what is the burden of proof on these people? Now in industries like, uh, even like Monsanto, now I know there's some distrust here, but think about it. In, I, because I used to be a pesticide chemist, I used to see what the burden of proof was on these. And in, in industries like the pharmaceutical industries, there's a huge amount of burden of proof on these industries before they put a, pro a product onto the market. Um, working at a pesticide company, there were times when I would put two weeks of work <laughs> into uh, recalibrating an instrument that wasn't working correctly before I could release test results. So when people say they don't put any testing into something, when people say uh, with GMOs in particular, there's no safety testing on this. Uh, yes, when I put a pesticide into the market, I would basically lick the vial and say, yeah, it's probably not gonna kill you. <laughs> I, that, that's really not how it worked. It's, it's just, just to clarify. But you know, this is always mistrust of something that you don't see the inner process on. It's mistrust of a corporation. And the other thing that you'll hear sometimes with places like Monsanto, if you can, I'm not sure how uh, visible that is on the chart, um, you'll hear sometimes they've paid off anybody who gives um, information that you can't hear too much about. Monsanto is about the size of Starbucks or Dish Satellite TV, and you hear information from them that GMOs are safe. Um, ExxonMobil is huge, and most scientists will tell you uh, something that you don't, <laughs> you don't, that wouldn't agree with ExxonMobil, that global warming is happening. How could Monsanto, about the size of Dish TV, pay off every single scientist uh, to say that, that their message that GMOs are, are, are safe <laughs> When, uh, when they're pretty much the size of Dish TV. It doesn't make any sense. So, and still be able to maintain a profit for their executives. So it's my last point on this, corporations are people too. I say this kind of because people get mad when I say it. <laughs> it's not because I agree with uh, the original politician who said it, but because you have to think, who, there are people behind these corporations. There are scientists like me. There are scientists who have dogs and families and who are going to eventually eat and use the products. You have to remember, it's a very cynical point of view to think that these scientists would poison the products they are eventually going to use. So the converse of this rule is that if they tell you their alternative, organic, natural, GMO-free, now gluten-free product is much better for you for, of course, 30% more. Now, I have to make a proviso here. I, I have celiac disease, so I'm gluten-free. <laughs> but this is always, of course, the natural fallacy that something is better because it's natural. And you have to ask, are any of these proven to be better? Now, what's the purpose of the labeling? A lot of times, the purpose of this label is just because it makes it sound better. It's a marketing term. Sometimes we've seen a gluten-free label on a watermelon. I've seen this happen, <laughs> and it's, I, some people will argue, well, you know, my child is, uh, needs to not have gluten in their diet, so I want it. 
the watermelon never had gluten. This is just a marketing ploy. With natural, there isn't really a good definition of natural. It just is a, a, an appeal to, to the natural fallacy because people think it's better. In the case of organic, this most organic products still use pesticides. It's just a different class of pesticides. So I want people to really question for reputability the terms they see on this. Now, I know I said a minute ago, profit was not a reason not to trust someone, but if people are saying that these other guys are bad because they're making a profit, always look to see if they're making a profit too. It's really not fair to demonize one industry for making a profit and then continue to make a profit themselves. So, and a lot of times, if, they are, uh, if they're making a profit, it's off, of a tox it's off of a detox. So one of the biggest things that you can look for lately because detoxes are hot, is if they are mentioning toxins or a cleanse. So these, they always do something a little different. The Bulletproof Diet, uh, Master Cleanse, Gerson Therapy. Bulletproof Diet, they're trying to reduce toxins by giving you coffee with butter in it. <laughs> Has anyone seen this lately? It's, it's silly, but they are trying to reduce toxins somehow. Master Cleanse, it's the lemon cayenne pepper maple syrup concoction that makes you lose weight and gives, gives your coworkers really weird looks for you when you're drinking the suspension. And Gerson Therapy allegedly cures cancer with juice. I, I don't know either. So you have to wonder when people are recommending these cleanses what their expertises are. It's rarely a person who has an MD and it's rarely a registered dietitian. These are the people who you want recommending what you take into your body. It's not going to be a person who's, uh, who's out to make money on the internet. The person who runs the mastercleanse.org, he's a money marketing guy. <laughs> I promise you, look this up, not right now, after the talk, please. But check it out, go onto your phones, look up themastercleanse.org. His background is in money marketing on the internet. This is not a person with an expertise in health. And one of the things that they always claim is that they are going to remove toxins from your body. A lot of these toxins that they claim are pesticides or heavy metals. The problem is heavy metals and pesticides don't create the clusters of symptoms that they claim. They'll claim you're getting acne, you feel tired, you're overweight. That's just not the cluster of symptoms. Their uh, pesticide poisoning gives you basically the worst flu of your life. Heavy metals, it varies from heavy metal to heavy metal. So in order to buy into the premise that you're going to be detoxed, you need to buy, buy into the premise that you're toxed. So think about that before you buy into one of these very overpriced cleanse. So the other thing is we can classify toxins under a panacea, but I chose not to because it's such a hot thing right now. Everyone's talking about toxins, but my, one of my favorite rules is if their product is a panacea and they can't really describe how it works in one sentence, probably BS. So the magical panacea is the least intervention is a cure. They're looking for one cure-all. Now, each of these on their own is kind of okay if they just let it be what it was. Chiropractic, if they just let it be a fancy massage, it wouldn't be that bad. Essential oils, if they just let it smell good, they smell good, right? They, it wouldn't be that bad. If, if they just said paleo diet would make you lose weight, it wouldn't be that bad. But then they try to claim it cures everything and Yvette gets cranky. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, so chiropractic, who here, it's okay, we're amongst friends. Who here has ever been to a chiropractor or has a loved one who goes to chiropractors? I forgive you, it's all right. <laughs> so the problem with chiropractors is the field of chiropractic started when a magnetic healer said that he restored a person's hearing by cracking their back. I, I promise you I couldn't make this up if I tried. This is a thing that happened, it's real. And now they're claiming, not all chiropractors, just most chiropractors, they claim that by stimulating nerves in the back, they can, they can heal the rest of your health because everything in the body is, is controlled by nerves. So they're helping the rest of your health by cracking your back. This is like saying that we're gonna fix your plumbing by, by pl working on your electricity. <laughs> This is not how any, that's not how any of this works. <laughs> it's just not true. If they, like I said, if they stuck to giving you, saying it was a good back massage, it would be fine. But it's, it's not how medicine works. They present themselves a lot of the time as being a doctor. It's not on point, it's not accurate. Please, if you're looking for relief of back pain, stick to a physiatrist, maybe a massage therapist. Um, essential oils, 
they, I believe it was Dutera, they were served with a letter from the FDA for claiming they could cure Ebola. Please stick to medicine. <laughs> th these people will get a training course that, co that lasts them a few weeks. Maybe just they have to take a test. It costs about $500, and they think that they're natural healers. Doctors went to school for much longer, and you'll he hear them say, doctors don't know everything. I promise you someone that took a three-week course for $500 and is selling snake oil, I mean essential oils, they don't know much, they don't know everything either. So, and lastly, the paleo diet. Now, whenever I bring up the paleo diet, I hear someone say, but it worked for me. Now, I understand when you cut calories, you will lose weight. This is the law of thermodynamics. And, and with the paleo diet, you are cutting out a lot of processed food. This is a healthy thing. You're cutting out uh, a large group of calories. However, a lot of times practitioners of paleo will say things like it will cure certain immune diseases. You're going to cure a, a handful of diseases. There is a website called The Paleo Mom that talks about different autoimmune protocols. This is not good science. This is not backed by science. It's just a disease. The other thing is the premise of the paleo diet is that this is how we ate 10,000 years ago. Because of selective breeding of crops, even if you cut out all GMOs and if you cut out all of certain types of food groups, the food that we have available now is so dissimilar from what we had 10,000 years ago that it's impossible to eat like what we had during paleolithic times. So premise is flawed. It's, if it works for you to lose some Wait, go ahead. Don't tell people you're eating like the caveman, please. <laughs> Make Sai Babe happy. <laughs> so, and speaking of things that don't have a lot of proof, breakthrough medical treatment courtesy of an unheard of blog or Dr. Oz. <laughs> So these are things I've seen online. I've actually seen from, from a blog that you can cure diabetes by taking cold showers. Please don't listen to these bloggers. But I, I bring up this pic, I, I like to use this for a visual because in one of the unheard of, again, one of the unheard of blogs, uh, my friend Jennifer found this picture of her that they had taken both these pictures in the same day to demonstrate that via lighting tricks, you could make yourself look like you'd lost weight. A few years later, she found it being used in a blog to sell their, their weight loss tricks. That's, that's a little horrifying that people would, would use that. But still, there's no burden of proof in a, on, on a blogger. And as we've seen, even with Dr. Oz appearing before Congress, there isn't going to be too much burden of proof. These places are not looking to give you proof. These places are not, they're not bound by any burden of proof. They're looking to produce content. Please, your doctor is going to be a better source. And a lot of times, I hear people saying to me, what harm could it do if you don't like it? Don't listen to it. This is what harm it can do. People are going to go to mommy blockers who say, I didn't like that there was a problem with the vaccine. You're going to have a two and a half year old who didn't get vaccinated. And they're going to use elderberry syrup. That's why I fight the anti-science movement. And speaking of anti-vaxxers, <laughs> if correlation is used interchangeably with causation. So I'd like to bring up two things on this. <laughs> one vaccines and two diet soda, partially because this is about the point in my talk where I really need a drink. <laughs> mm. uh, it does not at all taste like <clears throat> obesity, pardon me. <laughs> but you have to look, whenever you see a, stud a study, study that tries to claim that there is a link between these two, look very carefully at the language. There have been no studies that attribute autism to vaccines or weight gain to diet soda. You're always going to see language that very, very carefully tap dances around it. So I want to bring up a few uh, very spurious correlations. And there's this wonderful website that shows how some of these works. I love it. I don't think that math doctorates or sociology doctorates are causing the uranium stores to change or causing death by anticoagulants to change. I could be wrong. I've no, it's been known to happen, but showing that these correlations are, are occurring, I think is a great visual to point out that just because there's a correlation does not mean there's a causation. So back to the uh, autism debate and another kind of spurious correlation. Organic food sales have gone up. 
Maybe it's the organic food sales, or probably not. <laughs> we want to look at what else has changed during the time that the alleged rise in autism has happened. Our diagnostic criteria has expanded by quite a bit. Once upon a time, in order to be diagnosed with autism, you had to be nonverbal and deeply withdrawn. And now we've changed the definition so that you can, so that it's called autism spectrum disorder. So that we've, now that we've changed the definition to include more children and more types of cases, we're surprised that there's a rise in diagnosis? Seems a little silly. So now that we know how to diagnose the cases better, we're able to give uh, children the tools that they need to succeed if they have that correct diagnosis. I think that's actually a pretty good thing. So the other thing is we know that the rates of autism are exactly the same in the un, in the un uh, vaccinated population as they are in the vaccinated population. I think that's pretty good proof that it's not the vaccines. Next up, diet soda and weight gain. Now these two quotes are from the same study, or these two paragraphs. One is showing that all these things happen to diet soda drinkers. You have all these, the higher risk of obesity, there's high blood pressure, and there's metabolic syndrome, and these are all really bad things if you drink diet soda. And then, looking at all these things, the diet soda drinkers consume more calories and don't exercise as much. So is it the diet soda, or is it the fact that they're eating more <laughs> and not exercising more? It's, and of course, the he which do you think the headline tried to make it out to be? Do you think they tried to make it out to be the diet soda or the fact that they're not exercising? <laughs> which one makes a better headline? <laughs> the one that scares you away from my Diet Coke. I need another sip because it's so delicious. Mm. Fat people tend to be fat, is what you're <laughs> It's, and I've lost 90 pounds, and I was drinking a lot of Diet Coke while I was, uh, while I was losing it. I just, I ate less and I exercised more. It's, it's crazy how that works. But people, when they start off with a premise that they want to support, are only going to seek data that supports their premise. Now, this one can be used for a lot of different things, but I like to attack things like young earth creationism and the anti-global warming science, because they rally around that one book. There's one particular book that those folks like to, like to try to support. And I like to remind people, science starts off with a hypothesis and seeks if it is or just as importantly is not wrong. Whereas BS kind of starts with an absolute. They find that outlier and decide that's what we're going to support. It doesn't matter what all the other data says. We're going to try to figure out ways that we can bend reality to this one point. Now, I like to bring up the Bill Nye versus Ken Ham debate, and I'm gonna bring up Bill Nye again a little bit later, because I loved that Bill Nye said in that debate, when they asked, what could change your mind, he said, evidence. And that was perfect, because I think every single scientist I know, if they have something that they, I, I hate using the word belief, if they have something that they accept, they always say, evidence could change my mind. Uh, Ken Ham said, nothing could change his mind. And no matter what you're talking about, it's just not a scientific point of view. A scientific point of view says, I accept the evidence as I see it, I will change my mind as need be. Non-scientific point of view says, nothing you say will change my mind. And that's just, it's an atrocious way to look at the world. It's, it's not open-minded, it's not scientific whatsoever. And this is probably my favorite rule, partially because I'm a big uh, nerd. Um, if it's a Star Wars argument, it's better because it was done differently a long time ago in a country far, far away. It's, and this is what's applied to GMOs, actually. It's, um, is that we should treat GMOs the way that Europe does. Uh, because in Europe they're labeled, because in other countries they're banned, or we should use natural remedies because they were used a long time ago. I think that people are relying on some fantasy that life was better and we were healthier before, when that's just not the case. And this is always an easy claim to make because we can't see, or we can't remember, we're not in those other settings. We can't look and go, oh yes, people were dying in their 30s long ago. We do have a longer lifetime now. We just see that occasionally we'll see somebody getting cancer and we'll go, wow, people are sicker now. Not the case. We're living longer lives. We're living healthier lives. And we do see a higher rate of cancer now, but that's because in any population that lives longer, you see cancer rates go up. So it's a, it's a correlation that we're seeing, not a causation. The other thing I want to point out, policy coming from a different place does not necessarily make it better. It's, if you want to try to yank policy from another place because it's better, I invite people to take on the religious policies of some co countries that say that women can't drive, women can't leave the houses without their husbands, or that gay people need to be stoned to death. If you want to take the policy of another place being better. Not exactly something I want to adopt in this country ever. So 
But I want to point out a few things that's wrong with some of the uh, the Star Wars rule thing. If you can see at the bottom of the pay of the uh, screen, this basic f uh, formula of powerful tonic dates back to medieval Europe. That is from an era when people suffered from all sorts of diseases and epidemics, and this was touted as a as a cure for well everything because of course that's how these websites work. But what's wrong with touting this as a cure because it came from an era when people suffered from diseases and epidemics? They died. Exactly. They, this, even if they had it, it didn't really work all that well. So we had it coming from Europe, a place far, far away, and from, from the 1800s long, long ago. It didn't work very well. That's why we opened these shiny, fancy labs. We wanted something better. But I also want to bring up Bill Nye versus Bill Nye. Bill Nye, for, I actually had to change this from when I first started giving this talk on, uh, on BS detection. Bill Nye, once upon a time, was anti-GMO, said evidence could change his mind, and he, he actually went to Monsanto. So, of course, they gave him a few million dollars of shill bucks, and it was cool. That's, it was mind control. The reptilians got to him. But no, it's, that, that, people actually accused him of that on his Facebook page. It was amazing. But we are, right now, the problem of feeding eventually nine billion people is going to be a technological problem. It's, we still have people dying from malnutrition, but far less than we would without GMOs and without modern farming techniques. But Bill Nye said that with evidence, his mind could be changed. He went to Monsanto, he went and looked at the evidence, and his mind was changed. So I think it's wonderful that we can look at this new technology and see that it's helping people and see that it's sound. So just because it's done differently in Europe does not mean that it's done better. This is one of my favorites. If something doesn't play by any of the rules of science, so if you see homeopathy, which you may have seen a video of me debunking it by pulling a James Randi and downing an entire bottle of sleeping pills. Um, but this is the mystic crystal healer is a therapeutic touch therapy. I, I put this under the category of not even wrong. There's no evidence to any of these. If you hear words like energy or just look for the word quantum. If it's not being used by an actual quantum physicist, you're, you're being fed a line. So basically anything that comes out of Deepak Chopra's mouth ever, it's just, just not a thing. It's just, it's not just no, just yeah. It's, I like that applause. Thank you. That was that was good applause. We will keep. It's, I, I have a theater degree. I like attention. What can I say? Hmm. And lastly, for the first part of this. It's the, if it's the miraculous story of an alternative medical treatment working, and I like to focus on the cancer cures for this. It's, these are, now I, I bring up forks over knives because even though forks over knives was kind of a diet plan, they, they dabbled in cancer woo, and this was so dangerous to me. There's also Gerson therapy and Brzezinski's therapy. Now Ruth Heydrich presented herself as someone who a vegan diet cured her of her breast cancer, she left out in the, st in the documentary Forks Over Knives that she had surgery to remove the tumors. I don't understand. <laughs> I, I, I'm horrified by that because who could you know go through a life-saving therapy and then try to claim that vegetables fixed it? I, it's, I'm, I'm horrified that she would do that to other people suffering from cancer. Uh, Chris Carr, she still has cancer, and she's the one that did the documentary Crazy Sexy Cancer. I don't find cancer crazy or sexy. It's that could just be me. I'm glad she's still alive. I'm glad she seems to have found a way to thrive under seemingly impossible circumstances. But it's, it's horrifying to me that she is, is selling cancer as a lifestyle. And of course, it's a vegan diet and green juice enemas. I, I got nothing. <laughs> um, Jessica Ainscoff, she was, again, selling, uh, selling detoxes and selling the concept that, uh, that Gerson therapy was saving her from cancer. Now, when her mother got breast cancer, she put her mother on, a, on the same thing, Gerson therapy, which is, green, which is all the green juices, all of the 13 cups a day of organic juice and coffee enemas. Anybody craving a pumpkin spice latte? Um, and sadly, and she was making money giving speeches, selling 10-day detoxes, and up until she died in, I believe, in January. And this is, this is horrifying to me because I don't know who the victim here was. Was it Gerson? Was it her? What, someone here was a victim of horrible information. 
And this, this just scares me. This is why we need to fight this. We need to go out and get people to understand this information is not just a little bit of tomfoolery. This is dangerous. And Kim Tingham went on Oprah and said after reading The Secret, she was going to think her cancer away. She's not thinking much of anything anymore, and this is horrifying and sad to me. So this is why we have to fight this. Whenever you hear a miracle about something working, really look closer at the information before you buy into it or let a loved one possibly use that information because they could be avoiding a life-saving therapy. So lastly, let's have a quick little second look. Now normally, this is where this slideshow ends, and I say, now that you kind of know the rules of BS detection, you can look at this and go, it just makes stuff smell like lemons. But instead of trying to apply all our information here, we're going to apply it to a bigger target. <laughs> so as some of you may have heard, I, 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 write, I, I wrote a little bit about the food babe the last few weeks. We, we had a little bit of a kerfuffle, and the food babe had a, well, I had a better few weeks than she did. <laughs> So I, you know, it's most of the time if somebody gets one of these rules and you know breaks them, you can say that they're guilty of of selling a little bit of BS, bad science, or bullshit. Um, in the case of the food babe, I looked at all of my rules and I figured out she was guilty of breaking every single one of them. <laughs> So it was a bad few weeks for the food babe. I'm gonna get into some of the history that I have with her, some of her history, and show you how she broke every single rule of bad science detection. So a bit of my backstory with her. Uh, first, she launched her blog in April of 2011 uh, after she had gotten appendicitis. Now, most people will say, I got appendicitis. People sometimes get appendicitis. That's how it works. Um, Vani Hari is a special snowflake, of course. She decided after she went and read a bunch of food blogs and, and health blogs that she got appendicitis because her body was so inflamed. She, and, and she sort of went on this natural health kick and started her blog to tell people how to live and eat healthy. Healthier. And for a while, that's all she was blogging about. Then it turned, it took kind of a sinister turn, and she started, I don't know if I want to use the term blackmailing or not, but she started going after companies one ingredient at a time to say, this ingredient sounds scary, this ingredient is evil, this ingredient is linked to cancer, you have to take it out. And that got her into the national spotlight, and that very quickly turned her into this person who the media portrayed as, as being a crusader for health and for a healthier food system. I launched my site last year when she declared that she was going after the pumpkin spice latte. Um, and you don't mess with a Bostonian's pumpkin spice anything. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not safe. Uh, the picture in the, uh, in the corner here, she claimed that when she was at the Democratic National Convention, she took a lipstick out of her purse and wrote labeled GMOs on whatever piece of paper she had in her purse. I, that looked a lot more like Sharpie to me. I'm, I'm just saying, it's like, she has, but she does have a strange history with the truth. So that's our food, babe, she's very sweet. So a little bit more on my history with her. I first wrote about food babe's BS habits. Um, I did a debunking on that after a friend of mine. No, she doesn't like finding anyone, uh, anyone speaking out against her on the internet. So a friend of mine runs a site banned by food babe and posted her six unconventional habits. And she threatened to have, it, have the entire site taken off Facebook. Luckily, I have my own .com, which is nice. <laughs> so I said, oh, I'm not just going to post it. I'm going to debunk it. It was my first little piece that went a little viral. And I went, oh, people are, <laughs> people are really digging the debunking. There's a, there's a place for this, a bit of science, a bit of debunking, a bit of humor on the internet. And then articles, I mean, I definitely was not the first one to write about her. I definitely am not the only one to have written about this because there's a real hunger for, for people taking on these charlatans. But a lot of articles in mainstream press have been coming up. Articles in the New York Times and the Atlantic have been very critical. But Hari's reputation was, was never really all that scathed. And it's because no one could really, in these very mainstream places, go after her. I mean, I spoke with Courtney Rubin, the wonderful journalist who wrote about her for the New York Times. And she said straight out she couldn't go after her the way that I did in the eventual Gawker article because of the type of publication it was. And even Erin, uh, who did the article on me for the LA Times, said, nope, we can't go after her the same way that someone would in a blog or in Gawker. The language has to be toned down. So these places that have wanted to really just 
go to the wall on her, they can't. But it's been, it's been a buildup, it's been a lot of people writing about her, and nothing stuck. And then Gawker gave me a, sent me an email and said, let's write about her. And to date, it's had 4.7 million views and one little trending story. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the beginning of the fall of her. So we don't know where it's leading at this point. I hope it keeps going from here. So quick look at all of the ways she's broken uh, the rules of, of BS detection. So <laughs> number one, her, for her, they is Monsanto. And it's no matter what she will, if she sees somebody speaking out against her, she will try to link them back to Monsanto. In my case, when she did a rebuttal to the article that I wrote about her, because I used to work at a pesticide company, Amvac, she decided to uh, link in her article that I worked at Amvac that co-produces with Monsanto, and Monsanto produces GMOs and also produces glyphosate. I've never even touched a thing of glyphosate in my life and never done any research uh, in a laboratory on GMOs, but of course I personally did all of this because Monsanto. So that's, how, that's why you couldn't trust me. <laughs> so, but she's also, um, she's declared 610 products toxic or unsafe, and it's either because they have scary sounding ingredients, they have ingredients that are der derived from GMOs, but it's six, you would think maybe a couple of things at the store would have ingredients that aren't, aren't great for you in the course of a career. 610, and she's been doing this for just a couple years. So that's a lot uh, to claim that are toxic. But this, I think, is the hallmark of somebody being cynical versus skeptical. So I want people to ask questions. And she'll always say that people like me don't want you knowing what's in your food. I want you to ask questions. I want you to ask for reputable proof and to learn what reputable proof looks like. I want you to ask what's in your food and I want you to eat healthy. But when somebody turns over to being cynical versus skeptical, they have people thinking like this. They have their seven-year-old daughter say, why would Trader Joe's want us to be sick? That's a horrible worldview if you ask me. It says that Trader Joe's would poison their customers. It says that the scientists and the, the food scientists, the, the people who make this would be comfortable with their customers getting sick, killing off their customer base and doing bad things uh, to, to their own people. So I mean, it's such a horribly cynical worldview and it relies on that because if people aren't cynical and people aren't asking questions just of the people who are feeding them information, then they, she has no customer base. So I want, like I said, I want you to be skeptical, not cynical. And of course, the converse, if they tell you to buy their alternative product, it's, you have to be a little bit skeptical because there is nothing wrong with any of these products in and of self. But if they tell you that people like me are bad because we're out to make money or if corporations are, out, are, are bad, remember, there's, odds are they are selling something. Someone looked into it. She makes between 100 and 100,000 a year on advertising alone. I, I'm still trying to pay off my 2009 Corolla with 207,000 miles on it. <laughs> I've, I'm just saying. <laughs> but there's, like I said, nothing wrong with making money. But in her case, she's telling everybody that if you don't buy these, the competing products are going to cause cancer, or that you don't care about your family if you buy the competing products, or that you need to detox. And of course, buy her detox if you're going to buy the, com the, the competing products. And of course, <laughs> detox, detox detox. Now, I looked through her site, there are 28 blog entries mentioning detox. She recommends, and she does this, she dry brushes her skin twice a week to remove the toxins from her skin. And I don't know anyone who would less, even if you bought into the premise that you need a detox, I don't know anybody who would less need a detox because she allegedly doesn't consume any toxins. I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I just, maybe I don't woo hard enough. I don't BS hard enough to understand how this works. But this is how she works. But she recommends detoxing salads, detoxing juices, going gluten-free, dairy-free. And again, this, this bugs me because I, I actually have to be gluten-free. But again, I always tell people to ask, what's in the cleanse? How does it work? So I actually looked at her sponsor, Suja, to figure out what's in it. Now, she said about the pumpkin spice latte that it's bad for you because it has 50 grams of sugar. If you look at the one second from the right, 42 grams of sugar. One of them's toxic, one of them's okay because it gives her money. So, but if you look at it for three days, it will cost you 530, it will, sorry, it will cost you $162 and it will set you back 534 grams of sugar next to no protein, zero item, uh, iron or B vitamins. 
that's what it will, it will set you back, and it just puts some money into her pocket. And of course, they tell you it's going to chelate you. Sorry, if you actually need chelation, get dimercaparol. <laughs> it's, it's just a lot of, it's a three-day, uh, it's a three-day uh, bullshit sugar binge. So <laughs> that's, that's all it is. There's nothing to it, and of course, it gives her some money. But I, at first, I thought this was her panacea, and then I realized her panacea was chemicals, because chemicals are the big enemy for her. Uh, it's, and she said, this is an actual quote from her, there's just no acceptable level of any chemical to ingest ever. I, I, I guess nobody told her about the dangers of dihydrogen monoxide. <laughs> It's for the cheap seats, that's, that's water. I probably didn't have to say that for this crowd, but still. But no, I'm, I'm sure that she, that she probably, if I'm gonna be kind, I will say she probably meant additives and she probably meant you know, dangerous chemicals like, you know, like pesticides or something. But here's the thing, for her, her whole thing has been, I eliminated chemicals from my life and my health got better. But depending on the blog entry you read from her, it's this chemical made my life better, or, or sorry, eliminating this chemical made my life better and getting a shower head that got rid of fluoride made my life better. And, using, no matter what it is, it's buy this for me and it will make your life better like it made my life better. And it's been the basis for her business model, has been going out, demonizing a scary sounding chemical and it makes, and it will make your life better somehow. But it's, it, here are a list of all the chemicals that she's, <laughs> she's gone after. And this is just a tiny list. Um, there's of course the yoga mat chemical that was her first thing that shot her up to fame. Now I know it's, it might sound scary, I don't want yoga mat in my bread, um, but it's, you have to look at the dosage. It's been used since the 1920s. It's perfectly harmless in the quantity that it is in the bread. And when she, after, after the campaign, she even said that the, number one, the bread was too processed for her. And number two, it was just to raise awareness about what was in the food. Uh, next, the caramel color that was in the Starbucks pumpkin spice latte, it was, she tried claiming it was carcinogenic. When you look closer at it, it was at the same carcinogen class as the coffee in the pumpkin spice latte, i.e. not carcinogenic. <laughs> so she'll call something Monsanto milk because the cows are eating genetically modified feed. Um, BHT is a preservative in cereal that we actually found was in one of the products she was selling too. I think it was a foot scrub. Um, Polysorbate 80 is in, uh, is, is again preservative. It's something that she's claimed causes cancer and it's in one of the uh, butterscotch flavorings that she also claims is natural. But of course, if you put the label natural on something and she sells it, it's fine. And of course, anything that has GMOs in it, it's linked to Monsanto and it's the devil. But this is anything with chemicals on it that sounds scary is bad for her because she's not a good source of information and she hasn't looked into the science. If she can make the science, scary, it's fine. So it's, I, I like to go back to, again, she's not a reputable source of information. So whenever she attacks something that's scientific, instead of giving you um, a reputable way to, to fight something, she goes back to use something natural. Now this, she's wiped this off the bowels of the internet now, but we, you know, enough people have screen capped this that this is absolutely something she said. A few years ago, Angelina Jolie uh, underwent a mastectomy because, you know, a history of breast cancer. This is, you know, personal choice, Based on, uh, based on family history, Angelina Jolie made a choice with her doctor, wise decision. There was, the backlash from Vani Hari was, you should probably just eat vegan food. <laughs> this is horrifying. Now don't get your, your medical information from an unheard of blogger. This is horrifying to me. It's, this, is not, this is not a good place to get your information. This is somebody who's just trying to put out content. The other thing I always like to say, remember, this is someone who's going to tell you doctors don't know everything. She attacked the, uh, the, the glucose test, the, uh, what's it called? The, um, the gestational diabetes test because it had chemicals in it that she thought sounded scary. It had GMOs and dyes in it. Now, the reason that they use this, this type of, um, of concoction is because it's shelf stable and because they know exactly how much glucose and how fast it sh should absorb. And she told women not to take this test when they go to their doctor's office. And this is a test that women need if they're pregnant. This is why we don't trust internet doctors who don't have any qualifications other than failing out of Google University. 
So not a good idea. So the one thing you would expect from someone who's a self-made uh, ad advice person on food is maybe not to talk about vaccines. Oh, she went there. <laughs> the flu shot has been used as a tool of genocide. I don't think, no, she's claimed she's not anti-vaccine, she's only anti-flu vaccine. A friend of mine actually went to one of her talks recently and asked her what she thought about vaccines. She said she was still looking into it. I think she's done enough looking into it, but if she says things like this, and we found her reasons for being anti-flu vaccine, she says it's because of the list of chemicals that are in it, and she wouldn't eat this, never mind inject it into her body. I'm, I don't want to speculate on it, but when she's against getting a vaccine for something that kills 31,000 people on average per year, I, I'm going to go ahead and say that she's at least pro-death by just the flu. So, <laughs> Next up, if she starts with a premise and seeks only data that supports it. Now, this is one of the rules that you can use for a couple different things, but the premise for her is that her stance is always right and dissent is conspiracy. Now, I think this is the rule that kind of applies for conspiracy theorists. She has gone after every single scientist and every single journalist that's gone after her. And most of the time, the press is really good about not doing ad hominem attacks with her. On my website, I ban people who do anything other than go after the science, and that's pretty much everyone who goes after her. But for her, this is a screen cap from her site. Their agenda is clear. They want you to believe that GMOs are safe, anyone who disagrees is untrustworthy, and the companies care about our farmers, families, and a sustainable environment. Well, yeah, of course we do, right? She thinks this is a conspiracy. So you present the scientific uh, fact as agenda and just go on to discredit everyone. If anyone saw this, she attacked Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> she tried saying, can someone explain GMOs to this famous scientist? Oh, oh, food babe, I hardly knew you. And that was one of the places where I really started paying attention to her because I saw she's attacking Neil deGrasse Tyson, but it's not just him. At one point she tried attacking Kevin Folta and she'll go after credentials. She tried saying Kevin Folta wasn't allowed to talk about health because he was a GMO researcher as opposed to her, who's a computer scientist. <laughs> um, she's gone after Dr. Joe, Sh Joe Schwartz, she's gone after uh, Gorski, and it's always trying to paint some sort of nefarious connection to Big Pharma, or try to say that we have some sort of monetary connection to Monsanto, and of course there is no connection. There never has been. Again, 2009 Corolla that I haven't paid off yet. Um, but there's, there's never a connection, she can never prove it, and she tries saying that we're biased, and tries saying that there's some sort of reason that we're not on her side, other than the fact that she's just wrong. It's never that she's wrong, it's always that we're biased. So if you get to, I, I think there's, a, there's an old phrase that there's always one asshole in the group. It's, if, if it's not the person to your left, it's not the person to your right. You might, might want to keep looking right in the mirror. Moving on. So it's, if, it's not, if all these people are starting to disagree with you, maybe want to look a little bit more at yourself. So moving on. At the Star Wars argument, for her, it's, as I said earlier, this applies to GMOs. For her, it's always GMOs. And she claims that we're sicker due to the American food and drug system because she, at, when she started this, she claimed she was on six to eight medications that she's now taken herself off of because of the way she's eating. I mean, we're, I'm not going to ask for proof on this. I don't know what type of drugs that she was on. And we don't know if she just ended up, you know, inadvertently taking taking herself off of some food that she was allergic to. Uh, she also consistently points to the European model as better. It's because they have the precautionary principle. It's, there's no proof of this, and at this point we have so much data showing that GMOs are safe that I think she's ignoring data and she's throwing it out. She's also uh, in the vein of saying that things are better from a, from a different uh, setting consistently said that, that things that are slightly untrue about India and her family's heritage that my friend Coven Senapathy has gone after in her blog. And she tries to connect all problems back to GMOs and glyphosate, which are, of course, uh, patently untrue. Now, this I could have kind of poked anywhere in the slideshow, but I wanted to just plop it somewhere. It's because there seem to be a lot of misconceptions about glyphosate. Now, we've, we've done so much research over the years to try to give safer pesticides, and pesticides, of course, house both insecticides and herbicides. Glyphosate is an herbicide. It attacks 
broadleaf uh, weeds, and it'll it, it basically is going to wipe out almost any weed that is in uh, in your garden, in your uh, on your crops. And it's here's the thing: you don't need a lot of it. You need about a soda can worth for an acre. It's it, it's not. You don't need a lot of it. So whenever you hear someone saying it's being doused on a field, they're exaggerating by quite a bit. I wanted to ask a farmer, not a food blogger, less toxic than salt. And I think the reason that people have fear mongered so much is because of the association with GMOs and the association with having to genetically modify a crop in order to get it out there. So again, ask a farmer, not a food blogger. They're probably giving you some biased information. So the last few, people might have heard about her talking about microwaves and, uh, and, and possibly airplanes, something not playing by any of the rules of science. She, she botched a few things. And she's, also, she's gone after a few things that maybe didn't have any, uh, any veracity. She said laser acupuncture healed her allergies. First of all, an, an acupuncturist is not someone who's qualified to, to diagnose allergies. She claimed that she was severely allergic to refined sugar. Uh, carbohydrate structure of sugar that's refined, not any different from other types, pardon me, any other types of sugar. Uh, she's, that, so that was a little silly. Uh, her um, and then her going after airplane air, trying to claim that they pumped the airline air full of nitrogen. <sighs> Oh, Vonnie, I hardly knew ye. But she tried claiming they, they pump it up, to up to, uh, sometimes up to 50% nitrogen was, <laughs> was quite silly. And she also claimed that microwaves changed the structure of how water crystallizes. And sometimes it would crystallize the same way that it, was, that it crystallizes when you say Hitler or Satan to the water, because apparently water has ears and an understanding of 20th century dictators. <sighs> I, Oh, that's our little Vani. And of course, last, if it's a miraculous story of an alternative medical treatment working, she, she's a supporter of Gerson therapy and the Brzezinski Institute. She really, I mean, as we saw earlier, she asked, she, she was puzzled as to why Angelina Jolie would have chosen a preventative mastectomy. This is dangerous information. She thinks that these miraculous cures can happen. And even after a team of doctors removed her appendix, doctors, modern medicine saved her, she thinks that's what, that what is going to save people is removing uh, or non-organic produce from her life. So I think it's, it's a little bit disingenuous that after modern medicine would save her, she thinks that going to food bloggers is what's going to save your life. So I think it's horrifying that she's fallen into all of this. She also goes on shows like Alex Jones, and she regularly goes uh, to places like Natural News for sources of medication. So please, don't go to places that haven't been proven. Don't spend your time and money there. And please don't let your loved ones fall into this. So if you've noticed, all of my rules are if statements. So of course, uh, we're doing this as a hypothesis because scientists. So if all of this, then, as you saw in my headline, the Food Bay blogger is full of shit. So thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, Roundup, is that uh, glyso glyphosate? Yes, Roundup is, uh, is the commercialized uh, version of glyphosate, correct. Do you ever shop at Whole Foods markets? LOL. <laughs> occasionally, occasionally I'll shop at one of those places because they have uh, the gluten-free products that I, I like because, again, celiac disease, but I, don't, I, I try to avoid organic because I'm not giving them the extra money. So... <laughs> Uh, if Monsanto and all these chemical companies that put chemicals all over our foods uh, are so against uh, labeling, why is that? Well, actually, I'm against labeling, too, because why would you label something that's safe? Because they haven't proven it's safe. Yes, they have. How? It's because we're alive. Oh, it's, I see. Okay. It's, well, also, here's the thing. There, the organic companies put organic pesticides on things, too. There have been studies over and over again showing that their products are safe. And as I said, I used to work in pesticide testing. I personally worked on the, on the safety and purity testing of pesticides. And as I said, I promise you, I didn't just lick the vials and then go back to my office and watch porn all day. It was only an hour or two max. <laughs> max. But I mean, we did safety testing on them quite a bit. I promise you this is a thing that happens in industry. It's, I'm, I'm not sure where the information gets out that we're not doing any safety testing. This is pure, like, it, it, this is just not accurate. There's no safety testing or not enough 
safety testing done. So I, I implore you, email me, and I'll give you some backup information on this. I, I, I want you to ask questions, but I don't want you to be so uh, cynical to think that I would put in, uh, products into the market that would poison me, my mother, my dog, <laughs> everyone. So shoot me an email. Um, you, you were saying some things that were sort of uh, uh, denigrating the forks over knives doctors. Both of those are doctors with, with degrees, and uh, they came to their conclusions under scientific uh, um, criteria. And yet you seem to think, well, what they've come up with is bullshit. It's, this is true, but one of the, uh, none of them are oncologists. Uh, one of them, I believe, I think it's uh, Dr. Colin Campbell, was not um, a medical doctor. He is a research doctor. Uh, one of them is a heart doctor, not an oncologist. And one of them, I forget which one, like, because there were two main doctors in it. The, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, Dr. McDougall. He is, his background is in nutrition, not oncology. And he was the one that treated Ruth Heydrich. And they specifically left out that she had surgery for it. So there's no proof ever that somebody's been healed by a vegan diet. How do you feel about uh, carcinogens? It's, you, you'll have to be more specific. <laughs> Howard Lyman told Oprah Winfrey that 75% of the carcinogens you ingest are in the meat that you eat. Oprah responded that that's enough to make me swear off burgers for life. <laughs> and subsequently she was so, sued by the Texas Cattlemen Association and spent two years doing her show down in Texas because of it. Now. If 75% if of the carcinogens you ingest are in the meat that you eat, is it wise to maybe even cut back on meat? It's, I don't eat a lot of meat myself just because it's not what I like to eat in my diet, but it's as far as 75%, I think it depends on where you're getting your meat. Did the, did the cow smoke a pack of cigarettes before they were slaughtered? <laughs> so it's, it's I, I mean, it's... I'll, I'll have to look in that. I, I don't like to speak on anything that I haven't done my research on first. I think that, is that, is that fair? Well, generally, what do you feel about carcinogens? It's, <laughs> don't eat carcinogens. I would like you to not eat asbestos for breakfast, sir. So, but I mean, it's, here's the thing. Look at the class of the carcinogens, because if somebody tries telling you that something that's in uh, class 2B carcinogenic is horrible for you while they're drinking a glass of wine, that's pretty disingenuous, because group uh, 1 carcinogen is proven to be directly related to cancer, while a group uh, 2B carcinogen has never uh, b directly been linked to cancer. So things like coffee is are... are grouped as a carcinogen uh, because they have acrylamide in it, which is you know not which has never directly been linked to cancer, even though they, it's been shown like in a petri dish to maybe push cells towards uh, being dysplasic. I, I might be using that term uh, wrong uh, grammatically, but moving on, this is not uh, this is not something I want people to to worry about. I think I want people more to be worried uh, about drinking too much and smoking too much as opposed to the acrylamide in their coffee. So all things in moderation. Even even moderation, but please, you know, avoid cigarettes and and getting binge and binge drinking too much. Um, like, and as for meat in your diet, I, I tell people moderation. Like, lots of fruits and veggies. It's okay if they're not organic, and be uh, be moderate with your meat consumption. Uh, do the microwaves actually change the molecular construction of food? No, <laughs> it's it's it, they they cook well. I mean, it's. There, uh, well, here's the uh, here's a slightly more nuanced answer. It the, the microwave radiation is going to it, it's, it speeds up the the rate at which water is uh, is vibrating. It's and I mean when it cooks food, it does. Ch it's it's not a small nuclear bomb. Is is I guess the most um, honest way to answer that. As far as changing the uh, the molecular structure of food, I don't think in a way that it's not going to break down nutrients in the way that. Uh, the food babe is claiming. So that's the, the easiest answer for that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anything, any heating is going to, to, to break down things in a way, but not in any way that, that heating on a stove won't. Okay, I, again, piggybacking on the microwave. Uh, I work for LA Unified, and they're really depending on microwave emitters for Wi-Fi in the classrooms for all the testing. Have you heard that there are any concerns about the constant stream of microwaves inside a classroom? I haven't heard anything yet. Okay, thank you. So, it's, again, I it, sometimes this will be the first time a piece of information gets to me. So I'd I'd, I'd rather be upfront than speculate on something that I'm unsure of. <laughs> 
In addition to my role as atheist and skeptic, as aging bodybuilder, do you recommend that I eat more chicken and fish than red meat? It's, I, I think that red meat can be a good source of iron, and that's not a bad thing for anybody. Um, moderation is key in, in everything. Uh, you don't have to switch over from one to the other unless I think that you have a cholesterol problem, and that's um, up to that's between you and a doctor or a registered dietitian. But please continue to eat a lot. I always tell people, please eat your fruits and vegetables. It's always a good source uh, or the good mainstay of a diet. There's there's always some confusion because I speak out against people like the food babe that I'm against fruits and vegetables, and nothing could be farther than the, from the truth. Uh, I've lost 90 pounds. I have to, along with my Diet Coke habit, uh, eat a lot of fruits and veggies uh, to try to keep that off. Um, but please, <laughs> lots of fruits and veggies. The, the red meat in moderation, um, along with you know other sources of protein uh, to keep up the, uh, the bodybuilding. And you look fabulous, of course. <laughs> So, yes, sir. I want to preface the statement by saying I completely agree with you on the Diet Coke. Fuck yes, sir. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's not ladylike. <laughs> but, but I have a, a friend who I, I think is a very intelligent guy, and he's very much oriented towards science mm -hmm. and evidence. And he claimed the other day that there was, he said that there was good studies indicating there was some where your body would, yeah, I, I, I try to, let me guess, it triggered your insulin into thinking that you were drinking sugar, right. and... Which I would try to tell them, is it just because it tastes sweet on the lips and your body? You're, uh, ask them to find the connection between your tongue and your pancreas. Yeah, exactly. your, your, your pancreas doesn't have a brain. That's silly. Yeah, it's... I, 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 are there any studies at all that even seem to indicate that? I've never found one. Like, they're all... I mean, here's the thing. They're, they're starting to find... I've seen people debunking back and forth whether or not there is a link between uh, between some sort of um, gut bacteria um, and the artificial sweeteners, and I've seen people starting to debunk those. I'm still waiting to see if there is a strong connection. Now, I drink, I probably drink a little too much Diet Coke. I love Diet Coke. Um, if I see, and I've always said, if I see evidence that there is something wrong with it, I will change my mind tomorrow. It's, I'll change my mind yesterday and tell people mea culpa, I was wrong. But so far, all of the studies that I've seen, or all of the articles that I've seen, are based on a correlative study. They're not based on single variable studies. They're people, they're people saying that this is in their diet and this is what happened with them. So they're not really well uh, prepped studies. It's, it's just, it's hard to sometimes break out um, single variable because life isn't single variable. So it's ask them to look really carefully at how the study was done. And if you want, throw them in my direction and I'll take care of it. <laughs> So. Back oh, here. oh, yes. So there are a lot of pseudoscience blogs and bloggers out there, as we all know. Um, they're not all selling something. So what do you think motivates the rest of them? Uh, sometimes you have true believers. It's, I mean, sometimes they've seen, you know, anecdotal uh, data. Sometimes it's, I just know. Um, and I mean, there are a lot of cases where, and I mean, I've seen a lot of them start up blogs after they think they saw their child, I hate to use this phrase, turn autistic after their shots. And I mean, that's just when they start seeing the signs of autism is at a certain age. And they'll start doing it because they want to start warning people about what's happened to them. And I mean, these people are true believers. So, I mean, there are some people who I feel like we are never going to reach, and that's unfortunate, but um, as, as I've seen people who work in politics say, you have to go for the swing voters, have to get to people so that they know how to see if something is good information or bad information before they get sucked into the true believers. So, yeah. It seems like a lot of work to make a site like that and, you know, to pull all this, not, I don't want to call it evidence, it's but okay. supporting points. That, are, that don't really hold up as soon as you scratch the surface. And it's pretty easy to debunk, so I wonder why all their energy, and I mean, we don't know the answer to why they do what they do, but it's, Why do people go to church? I don't know that either. No one's, no one's paying them. It's okay. Etern uh, eternal life. They think this is gonna save them, and they, they think they found, they found their Jesus, you know? It's uh, organic food is their Jesus. Homeopathy is their Jesus. There is a woman who is a veterinarian in Long Beach who does nothing except for go on Twitter and tell people that I need to be neutered. So this is what this woman does with her free time, and it's, she's not getting paid for this. So This church of CFI will save you. Yes. Um, okay, a couple more questions. So. Thanks for your presentation. Oh, thank you, sir. I mean, you're you welcome. <laughs> when you cook vegetables, does it degrade the vitamin C in the vegetables? And if so, how much? It's, I, um, can, I, can I pull a number out of, the, out of thin air? 
<laughs> it's I I know that uh, I I, bel I I'm me that are pretty today. Um, I, I know that some amount of heat does degrade uh, vitamin C, um, but it's not a reason not to cook vegetables. Get plenty of fresh uh, food along with your cooked food and you're gonna be fine in terms of your vitamin C balance. Just, you know, please eat some oranges in the day and you'll be fine. I know that there are some uh, fruits that have over your uh, your recommended daily uh, amount of, uh, of vitamin C in them, so you'll be fine. But there's no no reason not to eat cooked vegetables due to, um, due, due to degradation of vitamins. So I wish I had a number for you. <laughs> that was my way of slightly dodging. <laughs> I apologize. So yes, sir. Um, are you familiar with California Senate Bill 277? Is this the one for, um, uh, for getting rid of? It's for getting rid of the personal belief yes. exemption. I, was, I thought so, it's yes. It's currently tabled in the Education oh, Committee. Man. Anybody who can take 10 minutes in the next couple of days to call the members of the education committee call. and encourage them. Uh, if I run out of handouts, it's vaccination, vaccinatecalifornia.org. Call, please. Co encourage them to pass that motherfucker. Like, it's, that's, please. It's, I, I live three miles from Disneyland. I was at Disney on the days of the outbreak. I, I only knew that I was behind on a booster because I run my website and took the CDC quiz seeing when I was due on my boosters and went, oh my God, I missed a booster somewhere along the way. So it's only because I run Cybabe that I had my booster two months before the outbreak. So I'm really glad I didn't get measles. Um, I really want other people to not get measles too. So please, 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 please call your congresswoman. How are the people have been vaccinated? No, they hadn't. So I'm sorry that you don't know. I'm sorry that you're not accepting of the truth here. But most of the people had not been vaccinated that got the that were victims of the outbreak. And here's the problem: it's their children, not the anti-vaxxers, that are getting sick. Now I would like to uh, stress that you know her great success is due to the success of uh, social engineering. If you could tell me what made people paid three dollars for a small bottle of Fuji water. <laughs> well, it's, it's from Fuji, so it's better. <laughs> it's, and actually that one is, that we, I looked it up, that one is from Fuji. So it's, I, I, don't, I don't think it's any better. It's just, it's a pretty bottle. But <laughs> there was, um, they did a, Penn and Teller did an episode of, of bullshit on bottled water. And they, this was an amazing episode. They filled up a bunch of uh, bottles, you know, pretty fancy bottles, and they gave them pretty fancy labels, and they filled it up with a, with a hose from, with New York City tap water. And they had a bunch of people saying, it, the, there's effervescence to it, and it tastes good. And it's, this one tastes better than others. And it's just, it's it's all marketing. It's all how you present it. And they had a water steward come out to this restaurant. And people, it's all marketing. And it's amazing that they get away with this. But you tell people that it's good and they should spend money on it. And they will. And this is, I mean, that's part of how organic food gets away with it, too. It's better for you. It's going to taste better. And I mean, some organic food tastes good. Like some of these products taste good. If you think it tastes better, go ahead, spend the money on it. But don't do it just because someone told you it's going to taste better. That's silly. And you're going to spend money that you could better spend on more conventionally grown produce that's just as healthy. So. Let's end it there. Thanks, Yvette. Thank you.